Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith-Rogers. Today, a look at ADHD, a disorder that is being diagnosed in adults more frequently than ever. Psychiatrist David Goodman, director of the Adult Attention Deficit Disorder Center of Maryland, talks to Stephanie Desmond about the origins of ADHD, why it has been difficult to diagnose in adults, and why drug shortages are impacting care. Let's listen. David Goodman, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. I'm glad we're covering this topic today. Yeah, so the topic today is ADHD. And I know that in recent decades, we're hearing more about ADHD diagnoses in adults. And I sort of thought it was considered a childhood disorder. So what's going on? Well, historically, we had thought about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in children and not in adults. It was often said if you were discharged by your pediatrician, you no longer had ADHD. And it didn't seem to make much sense to people, but that was the dictum of the day. If you follow children then past adolescence and into young adulthood and early adulthood, the symptoms really persist in about 60 to 90% of children. So this is a neurodevelopmental disorder that starts in childhood. It doesn't start in adulthood, starts in childhood and then continues for the vast majority of people into the adult years. And back when it was first described, because there wasn't medication, how were the kids treated? Well, this has been described in history for a couple of hundred years, actually, if you look back. And it's not something new. It's new to us in the last few decades because the increasing research shows that ADHD brains are different. We know ADHD is highly genetic. 80% of the cause is genetic. So you don't pick your parents and you don't pick your genes. And the symptoms of inattention, distractibility, forgetfulness, all can be common human experiences. Why people say off the cuff, well, I think I have ADHD today because I couldn't get much done. But that's not the basis of the diagnosis. This is really childhood symptoms that continue into adulthood, relatively unchanged, with levels of impairment. The person can tell you how they're impaired in classrooms and work and social relationships, or the environment tells you that you're impaired because your teacher moved you to the front of the class, your friends won't let you drive, and your coworkers think you're the weak link in the chain. So we're hearing more about this in adults, and people are being diagnosed as adults. So why is this happening now, and really, why is it so hard to diagnose folks? So the diagnosis of ADHD has been written about in the medical literature since the first article by Paul Wender in 1976. However, it took several decades for traction to be gained, and it was gained in part because the population studies showed that children continued into adulthood. Then what happened was the pharmaceutical companies decided this is a large marketplace of patients that need treatment. Let's do clinical trials with our medications we use in children with ADHD, and those proved to be effective in adults. That literature emerged in the late 90s and early 2000s. By the 2000s, public media then picked up on this and started bringing it to the public's attention. Now, the shortcoming here has been that professional training programs have not really had a focus on teaching ADHD in adults. So you have a lot of clinicians in the environment treating patients who kind of shrug their shoulders and say, I'm not quite sure what this is, and I need to learn more about it. And that's what we've been doing over the last 20 years. So if you notice from the CDC recent publication, the increase in diagnosis and the increase of prescriptions has just highlighted the fact that there are a lot of people out there who had not been identified and treated. And when you look at adults, I understand there's really no guidelines for how to diagnose them. It's true because we do have what's called clinical practice guidelines for children from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, but we don't have guidelines for adults in the United States. 
There are international guidelines on ADHD that include adults in their guidelines, but we in the United States have not done that. The American Professional Society for ADHD and Related Disorders has now undertaken the initiative to develop and publish the first U.S. guidelines. And what is interesting about this is not only will it be the first U.S. guidelines for adult ADHD diagnosis and treatment, it will actually be the first set of ADHD guidelines in the world that are focused exclusively on adults. You mentioned the genetic component, and I have two children with ADHD. Are people perhaps seeing their children diagnosed and then thinking, oh, maybe I have this also? Well, it goes both ways. Their children are diagnosed and then they do some research and realize it runs in the families and maybe they have this or they look at their spouse or partner and say, well, this is clearly where they got it. Or the pediatrician or the primary care provider diagnoses a child and then turns to the parents and says, which one of you probably has it as well? So the primary care providers are identifying adults who just diagnose the children. And also with the increasing public awareness, people are diagnosing themselves, or at least the symptoms are resonating with their history. And in the National Comorbidity Study, which was the largest psychiatric epidemiologic study in the United States published in 2006, of the adults who had ADHD that were diagnosed, 75% had never been diagnosed as children. So if you're smart, if you're not disruptive, if you manage to get your Bs in grades, then maybe you're not identified. But if you have a high IQ and you're daydreaming in the back of the class, you may be holding up academically, but you aren't necessarily functioning at your potential. What breaks down then as an adult is you no longer have the teachers and parents around you and you have to function as a consistent, dependable adult. And this is when people notice that they're just falling short and or the environment are telling them you're falling short in the expectations of how an adult ordinarily functions. So if I'm an adult with newly diagnosed ADHD, what do I do? Or if I think I have ADHD, what do I do? So if you're an adult who thinks you have ADHD, and again, lifelong symptoms since childhood with impairment, People have told you that you're just inconsistent and undependable and tardy and confused and disorganized. Then do some reading. Go online to some credible websites. So go to Medscape, go to Attitude Magazine, go to the American Professional Society for ADHD and Related Disorders, go to ADHDandadults.com. All of these are vetted and medically accurate information. Once you do that, now the challenge begins because you have to find a provider who understands what ADHD in adults is, they believe in it, and B, they know how to evaluate you. Often people will present with anxiety and depression because they're anxious about not performing at work or depressed that they have conflicts at home. And the clinician will focus on the anxiety and depression and not do an evaluation for ADHD. So before you see somebody, make sure that they have experience and expertise in adult ADHD. So you're seeing a doctor who knows what you have. You know, you said something that struck me, find a provider who believes in it. I'm curious if you could tell me sort of more about that. So because there's no formal training in the professional programs, a lot of clinicians still have prejudice about ADHD. Is this a real disorder? Are we just going through a diagnostic psychiatric du jour as we have gone in the past. And we want to make sure that people realize that this is a substantially medically validated diagnosis. And what do I mean by that? If we look at brains of adults with ADHD, there are differences in brains of ADHD individuals versus typical brains from the micro level at a receptor level right up to gross anatomy, which has to do with thinning of certain areas of the brain. So this isn't something that you're just making up. This is a neurologic disorder, genetically influenced, environmentally also influenced to some degree. It's not something you chose to have any more than you chose to have brown eyes or red hair. And that's really what the salient point of this in therapy is beyond making an accurate diagnosis, beyond getting medication that's very effective and getting organizational skills. 
the critical part to any psychiatric disorder in this day and age is to understand you didn't choose to have this. This is something like diabetes and hypertension and heart disease. You don't wake up one morning and say, you know, I think I'll spend the rest of my life with ADHD. It's not something you are. It's something that you have. And psychotherapy is very specific for helping people distinguish what they have as a disorder versus who they are as a person. So is this about brain chemistry? It is largely about brain chemistry. However, just because you have a psychiatric illness doesn't mean you're a victim to it. So the object is not only getting an accurate diagnosis and effective treatment, but it's also education as to what this is and what you can do psychologically to improve the quality of your life, both through compensation skills of organization, auditory and visual cues, reminders, lists, having somebody in your environment that prompts you. The thing about prompts, though, is interesting. You want to have an agreement with the person who's prompting you that they are doing it to be helpful and not to be critical. And you as the ADHD person need to understand that they're trying to help you, not criticize you. And that really is accomplished by a discussion between the two people because that often gets confused in the communications and it can cause a breakdown in communications. You know that my son has been having trouble getting his ADHD medication and I understand there are drug shortages. Is this related to the growth in diagnoses? So the shortage of stimulant medication now that started in August of 22 has been a result of multiple factors. The first factor was a manufacturing issue that caused problems with Adderall and Adderall XR. That then increased to shortages of other medications as patients were prescribed alternative medications. In October of 2022, the DEA said that there was clearly a shortage. We thought that was going to improve as supply chains improved. It has not. During the course of 2023, it was really a problem. Add to that the increasing number of evaluations, diagnoses, and the need for prescriptions. This was augmented by telehealth psychiatry that came online during the pandemic, so people were finding it easy access to get diagnosed. And all of these factors came together to create the perfect storm. This shortage has been reviewed now by the DEA, the FDA. There are senators and congressional members that are interested in understanding how this came to be. And the communication between these agencies has to improve between both the federal agencies as well as the pharmaceutical companies that are manufacturing the drugs. And hopefully we're going to come out of this on the back end. From my experience in my practice, this has diminished but it is geographic specific, not only geographically across the nation, but also geographically locally in that one pharmacy may have it and another pharmacy may not. So the best thing that people can do is just be aware of the pharmacies that have it and stick with those. And when shortages arise, you have to call around and hopefully your provider can provide some assistance. Is there any concern about overdiagnosis now? There is a concern about missed diagnoses and misdiagnoses. And that is the diagnosis isn't being made because it's not evaluated, because the clinician is unaware of how to evaluate it. And it's misdiagnosed because patients are being given diagnoses of anxiety disorders and mood disorders. The other element to this is the education of the clinicians. If the clinician is not well trained and educated and somebody comes in complaining about cognitive problems that sound like ADHD, a clinician may say, look, let me put you on a stimulant medication and see if it works. And if it works, you have ADHD. And if it doesn't work, you don't have ADHD. There's a fallacy in that logic, because if I give a stimulant to almost anyone, you'll tell me your mood, your thinking, and your energy level is better. It doesn't mean you have ADHD. It means I rearrange brain chemistry, and that's the psychological experience. If you want a non-prescription stimulant, it's why God put caffeine pills on the market. And on the horizon, sort of what do you see in the future for adult ADHD? So I think in the future, we're going to accept ADHD as a psychiatric disorder very much as we accept schizophrenia, major depression, bipolar disorder, and the other major psychiatric disorders. We're still in the conversational point of is this real or not? This is the same discussion we have with every psychiatric diagnosis that's ever come to light. For schizophrenia, we used to blame it on the mothers and call schizophrenogenic mothers. 
For depression, we used to say you have a lot of internal psychological conflicts, and if you just got over those, you wouldn't need antidepressants. For bipolar patients, there was yet another psychological explanation. And we're in the midst of having that conversation about ADHD. 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we won't be having these conversations anymore. The medications for ADHD are some of the most effective medications in all of psychiatry and, in fact, all of medicine. If you have ADHD and I put you on a long-acting stimulant medication, if we choose to do that, you're going to notice the difference within two hours. And as we get the dose titrated up, you're going to notice the difference within days, within weeks. It's a clear benefit. It's not a maybe kind of sort of working. This is like having blurred vision and put on glasses. And so, Stephanie, the next question you might say, well, do people need to be on this for the rest of their lives if ADHD is a lifelong disorder? And I'll make the same analogy to the glasses. Your blurred vision isn't going to go away. Put on the glasses, see how the quality of life is on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you like it, great, continue wearing glasses. And if you don't like it, throw the glasses away. The same thing is true for medication. You take medicine because the quality of your life on the medicine is much more satisfying than the quality of your life off the medicine. David Goodman, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Grace fernandez Ciciri. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, Matthew Martin, and Philip Porter, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production management by Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace fernandez Ciciri. Analytics by Eliza Rosen. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send us an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.